Welcome to the Past, Present, Feature podcast. In this conversation, Nathan Tape shares his experiences making Off Ramp, now in cinemas after its world premiere at the prestigious Polish genre festival Splat Film Fest, followed by the New Orleans Film Festival. Nate's biggest inspiration? David Lynch's 1990 film Wild at Heart, starring Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern. Nate dives into the making of his film Off Ramp, a film about juggalos, the super fans of the insane clown posse, and their sense of community and chosen family, sharing that he wanted to make a road trip movie that explores the meaning of friendship and belonging. Nate and I also reflect on our time working together on big film sets in New Orleans, where we met back in 2009, I think. These experiences provided valuable opportunities for growth as a filmmaker, such as building relationships in the industry and coming to understand how resilience and perseverance are key qualities for success. That it's important to embrace your own individual journey and that the satisfaction of completing a film and seeing it come to life far outweighs the challenges and setbacks along the way. Who dat? So good to see you and talk to you, man. Yeah, likewise. Absolutely. How is, are you still in New Orleans? I am. I'm still in New Orleans. You're never going to leave. I wouldn't say never. I might uh, leave the country sometime. You know, I, I would love to. As I travel, I always, when I'm out of the country, I'm like, ah, I just wish I lived somewhere else sometimes, you know? Yeah. I do love New Orleans. It's a beautiful place. It's unlike any other city in the U.S. So yeah, it's home, you know? Yeah. I feel like New Orleans is definitely not like the rest of America in many ways. Yeah. And it's the most European city in America, I think. And I think it's a good place to start this conversation because that's the city we met in. That's right. Back in 2009. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. It was. Of course, it was the Saints Super Bowl year. That's right. Yes. And it made me a Saints fan. <laughs> so look, 09, somehow somebody hired me to key grip a short film. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I did my best. And I remember meeting you day one and you were very nice and, and very good at your job. And uh, we became quick friends and you were a huge Saints fan. I could give a shit about football at the time because, you know, basketball from where I'm from, North Carolina. And what? It was week eight, the Saints season, I think, where the Saints came back down yes, like 21 to zero and Reggie yeah. Bush had yeah. that like 10 yeah. yard leap. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to, for me to like experience that first Saints game, at least through a um, highlight. So you were kind of relaying what had happened while we're driving a three ton cube truck. That was the thing is we were driving the three ton cube truck and remember we got lost. They gave us bad directions and we were in the middle of nowhere, Louisiana. And we were like, had no idea how we were even, we were like on a dirt road and we were like l- trying to listen to the game and it was like getting pieces of it. It was anyway. Continue. Yeah. We were like over there near where Britney Spears is from, which is in the middle of fucking yeah. nowhere. But anyways, good, good memories. And then look, I went back to North Carolina and I realized maybe this isn't for me anymore. And I considered moving to New Orleans and day two that I got there, you had already hooked me up with a job. On that Bruce Willis movie, Red, which was an interesting one mm-hmm. for two days, I think I did. But thank you for that. Thanks for hooking me up. Hey, man. You know, we, like you said, we went through fire on that little short and we got to be fast friends. And I think, you know, kindred spirits when they meet sometimes, you know, just, yeah, you know, you do these things, you try to help other people. I think this industry is about that, you know, it's such a loner industry, but it's also so collaborative and so reliant on each other as well. So like watching your career and your life in LA, uh, the things that have happened in the last 15 years, obviously, you know, it's just so kind of interesting to watch like lives kind of grow up separately. You know what I mean? One thing that's really awesome too is, I mean, I, both of us wanted to be filmmakers, not necessarily just grips and electrics. What's so cool is to see that we're now doing that, you know? We're, you know, we're very similar in that way. We, we were still filmmakers then, but we were just making a living working on big movies. And let's talk about how valuable the experience is being on those big film sets. Like you, you're not just working for a paycheck, you're getting information. You're not just working as a grip or an electric if you're a filmmaker. You're paying attention and looking around at everybody, especially the directors, you know, and it's like, talk about what you've learned, you know, through working on those film sets. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, it, it's there if you want to watch it. You know what I mean? It's one of these things that I think I always consider it like the rest of my film school, you know, you went to film school and you, I learned a lot about filmmaking, but then, you know, going and being on set, is just an exponential growth from taking that, that stuff from the theoretical into the practical. And then mainly having to deal with, you know, how things change and how you have to maneuver. And yeah, I mean, just like cinematography wise, like I was an electric with Matty Libatek, such an incredibly talented cinematographer. I was so into his work and to be able to just kind of like meet with him and talk with him and talk film with him and like talk, you know, just lighting and stuff like that. 
like that definitely helped me grow. And all the filmmakers, you know, you get a chance to watch these people and you see the things they do right, the things that don't work, the struggles that they have to deal with through all that time. And especially being in a department head position and having to like manage people and manage situations. The main thing I think that I really come away with is that you have to be a problem solver. I think filmmaking is solving problems. And when you work in a a larger production, you don't often get the chance to say no. You know, (laughs) you don't get a chance to say we can't do that. You know, it's how, you know, how do we do it? How do we compromise? How do we find a solution to this? you know, issue. There's always issues that come up, whether they are weather related, personnel related, whatever, there's always issues. And I think once you translate that from the big films to the smaller films, I think that those things are totally linked. At the same time, I think sometimes the stuff you learn on smaller independent productions also help me in uh, as a gaffer and on bigger productions too, uh, because sometimes a low budget solution is as good or better than a big budget solution. And sometimes they feed into each other. So I think staying open to like those things. And like you mentioned, like being observant and trying to take it in and see what you can. When I made my film, they all came back and we had many, many struggles. And to be able to overcome those, I would not have been as equipped just coming out of film school by any means. One of the things that always stuck with me, my memories of being on this big film set is how minimal a lot of the best images looked. There's been shows and films that I've worked on where it's like 30 pieces of equipment. And it's like the image is like, okay, some of the best looking stuff was just run and gun or or like one or two little pieces of equipment. And I just remember always remembering how it's all about understanding what you don't need a lot of times. And I think being on a big film set helps you understand that too, especially if you're going on as a filmmaker and making your own stuff, you know, and it does help to know how to rig a camera to a car sure. and it safely and to, to do those kind of things. But, you know, it's not sexy to be a grip on paper and people might not want to hire a grip as a director early on, but like what they don't know is like what I've learned as far as just, you know, how to light, how to, how to be safe, how to, how to rig a camera, how to uh, move quickly, yeah. you know, well, that's, uh, exactly, in the work ethic. You're exactly right. The other thing is, is the moving quickly is another huge thing. You know, if you just do things from just a student film sort of point of view, if you just kind of jump right from student film into making film, a lot of times you don't understand the urgency that's involved, understanding the urgency and being able to work efficiently and make decisions quickly. Because the truth is, is like, you know, as a filmmaker, making decisions and as a director, it's like one of the main jobs you have. Make decisions, <laughs> like give a solid opinion and being able to come to a decision and to live with it, to move on from it, as opposed to just kind of beating it up is another thing that's, re- I think, really advantageous. I do think, you know, for me, I wouldn't say it's a negative because it's all great work on the film. But part of me was like, in some ways, making off ramp, it was like we kind of did things too big. I mean, it was, still wasn't big. It was still very small. But that sort of bigger movie mentality where it's like if people don't all have this full gamut of crafts, just like stuff like that that you start to get bugged with where you're like, do we really care about the snacks so much, you know? On my next film, I want to try to do something with really minimal crew, really take it back to like, you know, a very, very small group of people. I want to ask you what your crew size was and just get all up in off ramp. But before we do that, it's a good time to push pause and rewind back to your origin story as a filmmaker. And also before that, I want to say on today's episode, we are joined by... Nathan Tate, director of Off Ramp. Which premiered at the Splat Film Festival yes. in Warsaw, Poland. That's correct. Let's go back to your origin story and tell me a little bit about when you knew you wanted to be a filmmaker, kind of what that moment was and some of the first things you actually filmed. Sure. A movie I reference often as like one of the things that really inspired me to look at movies was like I was a kid and saw Raising Arizona and one of my favorite movies it always has been. And I was really young when I saw it, but it was the first time I noticed the camera, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. For that, you kind of the camera's kind of an invisible thing. But then suddenly with like Raising Arizona, I sort of kind of was like, oh, like that's what's being done. You know, I started making little home movies like when I was a kid, you know, I would make weird little things in high school and I'd take the family's VHS player and like edit on two VHS decks and do all kinds of weird little stuff. So that was kind of always something that was there. And I had some like older friends in high school who like showed me some weird movies too. You know, I mean, I always was into guys like Kubrick and Coen Brothers and stuff, but then they they were like, hey, check out this Fellini guy. And I was like, oh, this is cool shit, you know? So they kind of started to open my mind and I've 
probably not a lot of, you know, sophomores in high school watching, you know, La Dolce Vita, I guess, at that time. So I, I was always kind of a, you know, cinephile nerd in that way. And then when I went to school, you know, I went to undergrad here in Loyola, New Orleans and like did like film studies and like made my own little things here and there. And then made a short film afterwards, which is not very good. Uh, and then decided to go to grad school and went to grad school at Loyola Marymount in Los Angeles. And I did pretty well there. Learned a lot about cinematography, was really involved in that. My films were pretty well received. And when I graduated, I think I thought that my student film would like light the world on fire, you know, like we all kind of do. And, you know, it didn't have a very warm reception at like film festivals that I was applying to. And it's a different world then. I probably didn't put in the right ones and didn't really know what I was doing. I was just like, wait, Sundance doesn't want this. And uh, <laughs> it hurts. It hurts your feelings. Like, what? They must have got it wrong. That somebody, they didn't watch it. I think my experience was that I was so sensitive and hurt by the rejection from my student film. I, I think it's why I like leaned into being in the electric for so much because I was just like, I don't know if I can take this. You know, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I can take the rejection for all this time. I mean, it was always in my head. I always wanted to make films when I was always working on scripts and doing stuff. And it was always like kind of there. But, you know, it was always like that fear of like getting back to that rejection. Oh, this is good, though. This is good to talk about. I think this is important information for people that are, they maybe haven't made a movie or they're in the kind of middle of their first one or whatever. Would you say there's like a level of entitlement kind of sometimes with us, like or with anybody that's 20 something and or making a film for the first time and submitting to a festival? Of, you, of course, you put in everything that you think you have into it and then you get rejected and you don't get love. I mean, that is tough. You know, after you felt the rejection, how did you kind of move on past it? Mm. You know, I don't, I don't know if I did for a while, you know, I, I think in a way, I think it always sort of fed uh, some things, you know, but it, it probably made me like a little bit more unhappy. And as a gaffer, like I was also like, it's a good job and I was good at it, but you know, I was kind of unhappy and was kind of an asshole sometimes. And like, you know, not necessarily as nice of a person. Like I've definitely grown a lot since then. And so I think I was always feeling, I think like the desire to really be doing this other stuff and like sort of feeling like I wasn't really fulfilling my destiny and my goals and my dreams. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, it's like how many people are lucky enough like we are to even have a chance to pursue their dreams. It, it's something that I think as you age, you sort of see better. You know, I think there are different filmmakers, too. I mean, some people just have it at 26, obviously, Soderbergh and Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson or whatever, like they they just had it. They knew then exactly. And some of us have to go through more of a, tr a journey. And I think that I look back at it and I say, you know, I, I probably would have been a pretty good filmmaker at like 26, but I think I'm a better filmmaker in my 40s than I would have been at, at 26. Yeah. I'm just more thoughtful about what I'm trying to do. Well, you got the Ridley Scotts of the world who didn't make their first feature until 40, right? And you got uh, Curtis Hansen comes to my mind, uh, RIP, one of my favorites, uh, you know, LA Confidential and Wonder Boys and... Michael Haneke didn't even do his first movie till 47. And then he has the most palm doors of any filmmaker of all time. Like, so I, I mean, love that. Yeah. I mean, fuck it. You know, I think too, it's just like it, in life, it's sort of like one of those things. It's like the journey is what it is. You know, I, I do certainly have moments where I feel like, like pangs of regret that I didn't make my film earlier and didn't like, you know, make that change and do those things. But, you know, A, what's the point of looking back anyway and B, you know, you can't do anything. You can't it's do just anything. a waste of time. It's a waste of yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And so you got to yeah. just look at where you are and be grateful for where we are. And But, you know, back to what you're saying too, and just to kind of touch on the rejection thing, I think one yeah. thing that I didn't, you know, and I think is very hard for students is that they don't understand that like there is actually a place for every film in film festivals, almost maybe not every film, but I would say 90% there's like a place for it. It just may not mm. be Sundance. It may not be. Oh, yeah. What we it's also what the programming team is looking for a lot of times, you know, and it's like if you get rejected by 40 festivals, but one really good festival says yes, then like that's success. You get in where you fit in. And it's also a timing thing and a programming thing. I think being too sensitive is not going to help. Yeah. No, no, you but you touched on something really good. And actually, I want to address that because the thing was, I was really sensitive at 26. And this goes back to your initial question, because working Same. in the movie industry made me a lot tougher because you had to deal with really big personalities 
very difficult people to work with, sometimes people who just didn't like you. And it's like, what did I do? What can I do? And it's like, it is a tough industry. And also in, as you know, as in a grip and an electric, there's also this like shit talking brotherhood that also happens inside those realms, which also like very competitive. And it's very like people are always kind of jabbing at each other. And so you have to develop thick skin and you mm-hmm. have to develop a, a method of coping, I think, really, because mm-hmm. we all have to deal with methods of coping with whatever is in our life, whether it's grief or rejection or sadness or whatever. And so I think that that's one thing that like I was very sensitive and as I've and also let's be honest, as we grow older, we grow a little less sensitive because we've just seen Mm. more and and done more. But I would say to young people who are going out with, you know, to festivals now, I would say, you know, try not to be as sensitive. Try to understand that there are like 1000 factors against you, if not millions of factors against you. It's also what I've discovered, too, is like it really is very much a circle of people that you have to get inside of to to get to know. It's just true. Yeah. It's not like it's just nepotism. It's just that all these things, this whole industry is personal relationships. You and I met in 2009. We have kept lightly in touch throughout the years. You know, we've seen each other. I think you think you came and visited one time, whatever. We've signed each other talk, but we stayed like we follow each other on socials. And I see you're doing a podcast to reach out, you know, and this is the thing is that it's those relationships. As long as you are, you know, when you make them, that you keep them. And, you know, I think when you do connect with someone, even if you don't speak as much, you know, it doesn't, it really isn't that, that big of a deal. I think as long as you still stay, you know, true to yourself and true to that kind of thing. So I think making those relationships really helps. I feel like it took me up until about two years ago where I was finally like, turn the corner on putting my end result of my project, whatever I'm working on up on a pedestal too high. To the point where it's like, okay, this is more work. It's, yes, it's passion and it's a hobby in a way. It's, it's my, you know, but it's my love, but like also it's work. And as soon as you like get to a point where it becomes more work than fun, I feel more comfort in that space now mm-hmm. as far as, okay, cool. This is just work. My expectations are to the side mm-hmm. almost. And uh, that's been nice because now it's like you decrease chance of disappointment with that approach. But also before I forget, the moment for me, as a grip, when I said, I got to move on, I got to go, was on Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, this movie in Louisiana. And I brought a, uh, it's a very boring story, actually, but Richard Ball, my key grip, was like, come bring an apple box to the director. I just remember bringing this apple box, this is moment, you know, to Video Village. And I didn't get a thank you or anything, which, of course, you don't get thank yous. You don't need a thank you. You just need an apple box. But I was just like, you know, I'm not the guy. I'm not meant to just bring an apple box. Like, I'm supposed to be here you know, getting the Apple box, not because I want to be the guy, but because I got shit to say. I got things that I want to do. You know, I'm a director. I'm not a grip. And I just never forget that moment, Richard telling me like, you're not a grip. You're a director. (laughs) Well, I think Uh, he would still hire me. Yeah. Well, he knows, you know, I mean, it's just still trying to, you know, you still got to pay your rent. And that's the hard thing about it. I mean, that's the hardest thing about this is how to monetize what we're doing is such a challenge. uh, And it's unfortunately just getting harder, it seems like, especially for independent Mm -hmm. filmmakers. I think there are some more avenues that are developing for us to do things. But no, I think everything, all creative art has basically been devalued to, you know, to a point now just because of the Internet and streaming everything from streaming music. You know, is like you think about it when we were growing up, you had to buy CDs. One thing you realize, like my friend, we went and saw like Echo and the Bunnymen the other day. And he's like, oh, he's, they're, they're very old and whatever. And I was like, well, yeah, well, they still have to tour because their songs aren't making them residual money as it used to too, you know? No, I mean, it's so sad that DVD and well, physical media just kind of went out the window. That was an avenue to, to make your money back. That window was huge. And so many studio films found their, their audience in DVD. You oh, know? absolutely. Yeah. So I was just in Calgary, at the Calgary Underground Festival and hung out with uh, Vincenzo and Itali and you know, his movie Cube was like one of those like, wow, huge, like, you know, blockbuster DVD, even VHS at that point, blockbuster VHS films. But anyway, it's just like interesting too to like think about that and talk about those, you know, things. He was really young. He was like 22 and he made that fucking it's crazy. You know, well, back to that too. Whenever you're in your 20s, like, oh, I didn't make it before I'm 30. I failed, which is silly. But all you're doing is seeing the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Chris Nolan or, you know, Soderbergh, Tarantino, PTA, et cetera. But it's like, that's not, that's just what you know about. 
Yeah. And I'll get off the whole young filmmaker sequence here in a second, but something about just getting to my 30s and getting past that, it's almost like this unnecessary uh, dread that you put on yourself. And it's mm. like, oh, okay, cool. Done with that. You know, and I think the sooner you can get over that, the better for your own sake. But but also I think there is value in using that as fuel and, yes. and using that to to make stuff and to see it through. I think it is important just to make stuff. And and you know what the question for you is talk about when do you know you should just go and make something versus making sure that it's ready to be made? Oh, that's a good question. All I know is like so basically other than music videos and whatever, I made a short film in the end of 2019. And and then I made Off Ramp in 2022. And both of those things and those scripts were things that I have been had for a long time. So they were like, and I kind of worked on just periodically. I just come back to, I mean, I think I want to say years. I mean, there was definitely like Off Ramp was like eight years or something. We had, wow. yeah, it was a long time. Partially because, you know, I just kept getting work and kept getting jobs and it would be like, oh, you're going to turn down this like four month job, you know, doing a TV show and it means so much money and money for all the people working for you. So that's one reason with off ramp. And so with with Mariah, my short, I was like, okay, I just got to like go do this and like prove to myself that I can do it and prove to myself that I can do something you have to have that internal drive. You have to like want it, you know, you really have to just want it. And sometimes it comes with a lot of fucking darkness because you're like, oh, mm-hmm. no, I'm not getting it. I'm I'm this age and I haven't done this. And I'm, I'm this age. A little voice. That. Yeah. <laughs> that being driven is a hard thing to continue to manufacture. But I think, you know, sometimes it does. I mean, partially like when I made off ramp was like, I basically was during the pandemic and, you know, we all had time to sit around and think and I was just like, you know, do I really want to just keep being a gaffer for my whole life? Do I really want to, you know, bring people lights for a living? It's a good job, but it isn't satisfying my soul. And uh, I was like, when am I going to do it if not now? And I think that that's part of it is saying, if not now, when? The other Mm -hmm. thing I would say, and, and tell me about your experience with making your first feature. Also, one thing is like setting a date and making a decision and like moving towards that decision is really huge with like off ramp. Like we, the script was at like a certain point and then we decided, okay, we're going to do it at this date. And even then we still worked on it. And actually some of the biggest revelations and changes, some of the most epic like things in the movie happened in that last eight, nine months or whatever of working on the script and I'm like getting ready for it, but just setting the like decision I'm going to do this was real motivating. Now, when to say it's ready or not ready, I mean, I think you just, in my opinion, I think you just have to, once you set that date, you just are kind of going for it. I, does anybody ever really know that? You know, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think when you look at it and you feel pretty satisfied with it, when you read through the script and you like it and it makes you feel good the ways you want it to make you feel, you know? There's this moment for me when it, when I get to that point where I'm reading it and I'm like, Okay, we're ready. Let's go. I have no patience, like no patience. I have some, but it escapes me uh, sometimes. But but man, it's like nothing is more exciting than actually taking action. I look back and sometimes I wish I would have prepared and done a little. Well, I did prepare, but do a little more developing, a little more. But I think uh, I'm very happy with the lessons that I've learned. And also some of the best outcomes that I've had have been from just taking action and not over preparing. Sometimes the line you add at the very last second while you're like in as you're rolling and you just spit it out and you're like, oh, that's so perfect because you but I think it's also because you've prepared yourself to be in that creative moment where you can be purely creative and you're not feeling too bothered, you know, bogged down by the schedule or the things or whatever, you're just kind of giving yourself that sort of freedom. And then this is something I struggle with right now because I'm like trying to figure out, you know, exactly what to do next as a filmmaker. And, you know, I have this fear that I'm like, well, the reason why Off Ramp turned out so well is because we were basically developed it for almost 10 years. <laughs> and like, I mean, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, I'm like, I'm like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I'm like, you know. And it does take time sometimes to let something simmer. Well, and you, you know? also, you have to live with these films. I mean, you know, that's the other thing. Tell me about is that it. It's not... You it's can't like, take them off the internet and the IMDb. <laughs> they won't let you. <laughs> the concrete's been well, poured. Well, just as a filmmaker, I mean, just the physical time it takes to just write, shoot, edit, color, sound... Then deliver. To go through f- to deliver. <sighs> or, or depending. Or festivals. 
then deliver or whatever, all of this stuff. I mean, for me, like I said, we shot in January of 22. And so it's two plus years now before the film will be out in, you know, the public's hands. And then to think of how many, you know, it was another year of develop, if working on it before. And, and then you're like, well, now it's also there for the rest of my life too. So it's like, you do live with this, these things. But at the same time, too, it's like, you know, there's other filmmakers. It's just like so make it. It's kind of like people are different. You know, somebody like mm. Tarantino or, or Kubrick or, you know, it's take years and years to between their films because they really want to like they really work on them that way. Then, then you have like film- a Soderbergh behind me right. who just busts them out. And like yes. there's no correlation that I can tell between lack of quality and time spent. A lot of times. No, I, you know. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think that there's a very much an argument for each of them or, or you know, Altman would be another one I would think of mm. too, right? Or, or he was spitting them out too. And to me, the thing with Soderbergh, I love Soderbergh, but I feel like his, his early career was his peak. He's had good moments, but I just think that he like kind of got to a point and then it's kind of like, it hasn't really, it's kind of like plateaued a bit. Um, Maybe there have been films or, or moments in films where I'm like, oh, this does feel a little bit rushed for sure. But then you yeah. look at like the Nick, like, Mm. That I love that show. So good. Yeah. Uh, Clive Owen. And he shot that whole thing, shot and directed it in 73 days, I think, the whole season. Oh, and I mean, look, I love yeah. it. But again, it's like there's no rhyme or reason to like you, you got to everybody is yeah. different. Every filmmaker is different. I also really appreciate and, and I'm so jealous of, of course, Tarantino's career where it's like the perfect career, you know, yeah. uh, but that's just his or story. Kubrick. Or Kubrick. His, every, every Kubrick, one of their, perfect career. Every, every one of their films. Yeah, they just have this perfect career of like just only highs and only ever doing what they want to do. Um, PTA is probably up there, too. Yeah, he is, too, as far as his like ideal Mostly. kind of careers. Um, yeah. Also, you know, there's, like, there's a German filmmaker named uh, Fassbender that I referenced Rainier. a number of times. And Reiner Rain, Werner, yeah. And he died at like 37 years old and made 42 movies. See, come on. (laughs) Yeah. And 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 do was like, and like some of them are absolute masterpieces. Like some of the greatest, Ali Mm -hmm. Fury's The Soul is a masterpiece. I mean, and he's got like a handful of masterpieces. He also lived fast, die young, you know. Point is, I think it's like, it's however you work and whatever you find. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's different. And I think you just got to take your path and realize that your journey is your own. If you can make a film a year, fuck yeah. And like, do it. And if it takes you five, I think, you know, you just got to look within and say, am I happy with this? I mean, my co-writer and I have since off ramp have written two scripts and we're working on a third one. And we're still just like, is this the right one? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I don't know. So I I did a film in uh, 2009. I think I just made it before I met you, or maybe it was in right when I was, had I made Half Empty before? I, I met you. Do you remember sure. that, that that small film that we did? Anyways, around that same time in 09, 2010, I directed it with a friend. We used the Wilmington, North Carolina film community as the crew. And it was like enough time in between shows to uh, to do that. But anyways, getting that out of my system was everything. I've made a feature, you know, it's almost like this confidence thing that you get. And just also just knowing that you can do it. It is that proving to yourself, just get it done. But luckily also it turned out really good. Unfortunately, it's a comedy and it's a comedy of its time. So it didn't really age too well as far as a lot of dialogue goes. But no, I mean, what a cool movie. And then it took me six years to do my next film about a bald actor in Hollywood, which again, I just took what was around me and my friend's kind of story. We Seinfelded it in a way where it's like, okay, we're going to take your real life and we're just going to like exponentialize it. You know, again, I look back at that and I'm like, ah, shit, I should have cut it tighter. I should have done this, should have done that. But same time, like that got me to the next place. You know, each film kind of gets you to the next thing, the next thing. And so like moving on to like finally off ramp, like as far as we've already touched on developing it and stuff, but talk about, you know, what production was like. And then also leading into that, leading into the film festival premiere at a, a splat and then new Orleans film festival. So we shot uh, primarily in January of 2022. Um, We had 18 shooting days. We did three six-day weeks. We got everything in the can in that time. But then right as we were ending the film, right at the very end, we discovered that uh, some cards were lost. Oh, no. Yeah. We lost like three cards worth of footage, like a day and a half worth of footage, maybe even 
Yeah, we lost a significant amount of footage. Was it a hefty kind of amount of production? Was it like any effects, any stunts, anything like that? Oh, yeah, it was a huge, there was a big fireworks sequence. There was some stuff that was pretty big. I mean, I'm thankful for it wasn't bigger than it was, but like, for instance, there's this one shot that we did once, this one scene where they first enter Scarecrow's house and it's a one you know, and it had like our largest number of cast and, you know, seeing the most of this like, you know, trailer that we had like set decked out and stuff like that. Where we did 13 takes of it, we were able to like recover 11 out of the 13 takes off of this hard drive. And the 11th take that was the one usable take that was we could recover had some like artifacting and some digital you noise. Past QC, yes, or... exactly. But I had a genius fucking dude who I knew just down here, like a friend of a friend who was like a effects guy and he was like oh we can fix it and so he went and fixed it and it was like a miracle so so we so we lost those cards because they were integral scenes to the movie you know a lot of times a movie of that size you wouldn't uh do reshoots you just kind of accept it and try to figure it out but we had some of it was pretty important stuff to the story so it was like okay we're gonna do it so we had to recommit make get more money so we made plans for the end of March to, to, to shoot the reshoots. The good thing about that is what it gave me is then it gave me basically all February to edit and March too. So my co-editor and I like basically put together assemblies and, you know, started working on it so we could really, you know, see what we were doing and see what was working mm-hmm. and what wasn't. And one of the most interesting things that we discovered is there is like a really important scene where the guys get pulled over by a cop and like we had all the footage, but it was just wasn't working. Like it just wasn't there there were some things so you were, were able just, to redo that while you so were already we reopening back and we're reopening it we went ahead and redid that and like that is like so crucial because it really did it made the movie significantly better and honestly in general the reshoots made the film better because we thought about things my co-writer and i made some edits and some decisions and like just kind of like you know we just basically you know came up with some other shit and just were like okay this will make it better and since we we're going back we we did that it's kind of like a workshopping thing i mean half empty we made that and active for hire the opening scene was the short film and we reshot both of those two different times and obviously i mean the last version was definitely the best i mean the more you do something the better you're going to get conversely a lot of times you know it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know? And I think like with documentaries that I've been kind of switching to, it's been really nice. I don't have a choice, you know, to like, I have to live with the first take. So for me, coming from fiction and like needing X amount of takes, you know, and like trying to get things right, because you're, you're, it's a symphony between camera and acting and all this. But man, documentaries, I don't have to worry about <laughs> any of that. And it's been wonderful, you know, selfishly. Uh, but but I do miss fiction and I want to get back into it. And, it. and it just lets me, like documentaries just remind me of how amazing fiction, good fiction is when it's sure. done correctly. Sure. And how hard it is, you know, and how much yeah. I, um, when I do go back to it, which I will, I'm going to be more ready, I guess, maybe do mm-hmm. more developing. This is just where I'm at. You know, we all have our yeah. different things. Um, anyways, highlights. What's some of your favorite moments from like production? There's a sequence in the middle of the movie where the characters are in a bedroom and it's like a real bonding and interesting scene. And it's really, it was like just shooting. It was also magical. Like it's a magical scene in the movie and it came out really awesome. It's really kind of where the film turns and it's one of the things I'm most proud of in the film. And it was just like, there was just this like spirit while we were making it. It was just so magical. All of us and the actors, you know, DP and I, and we just all like knew that like, this was like the, the thing. It was just a really, that those two days, we had two days to shoot it. And it was just like some of the most fun, emotional, cool stuff I've ever done. Um, that's a highlight. Another one that's a pretty like a low light highlight uh, in a way, but it's a it's a good story is that we uh, Scarecrow, who's one of the main bad guys in the movie, he uh, the actor, we had two nights to shoot the ceremony scene, which is like this big scene and Scarecrow's like the center of it. Uh, and we had two nights to shoot with him, uh, shoot the scene. And the first night he gets a blood clot in his neck and can't come into work, has to go to the hospital. And we were like, well, we'll just have to shoot around it. We can't, it's independent filmmaking. We can't take the night off. So. I sat in his chair and like wore his costume and we shot like, you know, whatever we could, which included a lot of inserts and special effects. I mean, you know, practical effects and stuff like that. And then uh, we crossed our fingers and prayed to the dark carnival and 
the next day he was able to come back and we were able to complete the scene and you'd never know. He's incredible and his performances are great. So those are some highlights. I mean, it was just a really awesome shoot. You know, I think when you have a script that people are really excited about, I tried to be really warm to all the people. And I think one of the things that I learned so much, again, going back to that learning from being on set was I was like, when it's my turn to do this, I'm going to be the best version of myself I can be. You know, I'll try to be as kind and as calm and as understanding of the situations. At the same time, you know, we have our plans and I'm certainly in charge and I'm not going to take no for an answer. I think being through those experiences, dealing with directors who didn't know what they were doing, were assholes, wouldn't listen to suggestions, would would cause more problems than they would solve, or just didn't have, you know, on the flip side, weren't confident in their decisions, weren't moving forward with those things, weren't, you know, making quick decisions. Realizing too that like, you know, it's all like, like you said, you're working in documentary. Like it's also one of those things that in documentary, you're not controlling it, you're capturing it, but yet you still can create a narrative out of it. And sometimes it's a really beautiful thing. I think there's so much more that you can do with once you kind of have it, you know, like you said, you can keep creating. The process doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. I think staying in that like creative space and staying open to the collaboration. I, and I think that's another thing. I don't know about how you are, but I'm really open to the collaboration mm -hmm. um, because, you know, A, in one hand, the director always gets the credit anyway. So why not take it? And the blame. It's a good idea. And the blame. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get it one way or the other. Yeah, and you mean collaboration with actors, with cinematographer, et cetera, right? I mean, virtually, I mean, I'm pretty open to almost anyone on set, you know? Sure. I mean, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll shut it down if it's somebody, if there's somebody I don't, like, align with. I mean, but mostly your main creative collaborators, obviously. Um, well, I think like, best idea said, wins, for sure. Even if I have, like, uh, yeah. even for this podcast, like the, the logo or whatever, you know, it's a work in progress, but I'm sending it around to 10 of my people, you know? If most of them like version three, and I asked them, then I, I went with version three because I was indecisive as far as after that I gave them four options. It's like, cool, yeah. hive mind, what's up? You know, it does help to have yeah. that. It's good to just ask, you know, what, what people think, but also it's good for you to know when to make the decision after you get the information, right? Well, I, th I think you have to make the decision. It's our job as a director. It is, you have to make the decision. And it doesn't mean being wishy-washy. It just means being open to a good idea. Yeah. And when a good idea comes, in all frame, there's not a ton of improv, but there's some. And it's like a little bit, it's like a line here or there. And usually the actors would like ask me ahead of time and we talk about it. And almost all the time I would get what was scripted just to have it. And I think when you go, I went back to it, I mean, it was still is that like best idea wins you know, because it's like whatever ends up being the thing. And you realize too, that like when everyone is, when people are more involved in it, they just give you better work Yeah, and they feel a part of it. And then they, they feel some ownership over it. And that's also the thing, I think going back to what you're saying about being on Vampire Hunter, it's like, I think, and myself on, it's like, you end up feeling like you're just a light jockey or a, you're, you're just doing something for someone else. And like, it, it never feels good to not be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you are creatively oriented as we are, yeah. you may be like, Hey, this is a great job. I can bring boxes to people all day long and get paid this. Good sure. That, in, in the first and three that, years, I was thrilled. What else you need? You know, no problem. Here's yeah. your box. You know, And it is, you, it is a good job yeah. and it's great. And you get to see amazing places and oh. see cool things. Meet and new people. Meet cool people. Yeah. Look, I, mean, I wrote like super quick segue. I watched the fall guy finally last night. And did you see that yet? Not yet, no. The story world is the film set, you know, and yeah. just the camaraderie. And, and I just totally got so nostalgic about because that's not my life anymore. You know, I haven't been on a major, yeah. a huge film set in a long time. I miss the shit out of it. I mean, it's such a great kind of, um, you're in the army together, I feel like. Yeah. But um, anyways. Well, that's, that's very true. It is going through a battle together. And I think that's the thing is that you do, you either come out of it for great friends or better enemies in a lot of ways. And <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the thing you and I went through a battle with Terrebonne and doing a short film in the swamps of Louisiana, driving this busted up three ton and like having, and just the two of us doing it. And like, they weren't like rude and they were very, but there was a lot that we had to do. Oh it was my hard. And God. It was, yeah. I mean, they were understanding. Wow. And even, you know, Zoe who shot that, she went on to do pretty well. She's in, she did like, um, Handmaid's Tale. yeah. Real quick before I forget developing, we touched on most of it, but like, what did the idea, where did the idea come from off ramp? Like how did that seed grow into off ramp? So, you know, off ramp is about juggalos. We haven't really talked about that much, but saying clown posse, I used to love them in the ninth grade. 
Yep. You know, if you're not familiar, Juggalos are, you know, the super fans of Insane Clown Posse and all things Psychopathic Records, a Midwest group of musical super fans that have been called kind of the the last uh, subculture in America. So, you know, back in like mid 2000s, late 2000s, there was a lot of coverage of the, of the Juggalos. You know, Vice was really big into them. There were a lot of like, you know, podcasts and documentaries and things. And a friend of mine showed me one documentary called American Juggalo. And if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's short. It's like 20 minutes on YouTube. It really like it was funny and interesting. And what it really introduced me to was the concept of Juggalo family love, which is basically like the idea that if you're a Juggalo, your family, you know, that these people from these kind of different groups of place, you know, they may not have the best blood family in their life. So they have their found family and chosen family. And so I really connected with that. And I just thought that was such a beautiful idea that these uh, malign, this malign, line subculture of these people who are often mocked and sort of like looked at in a certain way and kind of like, you know, said with a chuckle and like these kind of things. I just thought, you know, this idea that they come together and then they love each other in this sort of, uh, you know, more Christian than some Christians kind of way. And I just was really thought that was really cool. And I thought it would be a just, I, you know, thought it would make a cool movie to make a road trip movie about juggalos who really find like kind of the meaning of friendship and, and chosen family on their, uh, their road trip. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where it came from. There are a lot of different versions of it. At first, our film, probably the first versions of the script were even more like in line with the Vice stuff where it was kind of laughing at them almost. And as we got deeper into the script, then we realized, wait, this is the wrong idea. Let's, we need to laugh with them and get to know these people. So I went to the gathering of the, after writing the script, I, I met some Juggalos online. I got introduced to a few of them, kind of met a few different ones. And I went to the gathering of the Juggalos in 2021 to both shoot like B-roll and to kind of just, you know, I was like, I'm going to be a poser if I, I can't, I can't not, I can't not go to the gathering if I'm going to make this movie. Got to do some research, um, some recon. Got to do some, and I had done lots of research Search right, right. As far as like, but like it was like from my like computer and like from like so a continuing to distance. go further down uh, into the pool, if you will. If, yeah, you know, really go. Well, go really go meet these people and spend time with them, and like yeah. you know, not like look at them through a, a lens so much. Sure, that really helped the film because I really got to know a lot of these people, and I think some of them are dear friends now. And they're, that. you know, I learned so much about uh, the culture, and it's just a, it's a very cool culture. And these people, this generation, and these people who kind of feel like they have no culture have like created this culture, and it's also just like a crazy thing because like community is like sort of a dying thing in this country. You know, there's not. Um, we, we don't we have this very individualistic mentality and not this like sort of communal idea just because the word c-o-m-m like c-o-m-m-u you know and then people are just like communism and you're like well i mean the idea of community is actually like how we survive best as like creatures right right and animals and so much of this country we've been taught to be individualistic and it's like you know i i so I was really just touched by all this stuff. Sorry, it's kind of a tirade, but... but That's I, the reason I, why I started I, this I, podcast, though, too. Just a lack <laughs> of community. I need it. It's time to do it. Yeah. Don't worry about yeah. anything. Just do it. So, yeah. No, I yeah. hear you. Community... It is so true. And I, that's probably the favorite, my favorite part of this interview so far is what you just mentioned about kind of the world we're in now. It's definitely been kind of fragmented and we're split off and, and isolated. And it sometimes feels like we're still in uh, COVID, you know? It's like... A lack of community is a real thing. I mean, ever since COVID, everything is, you know, so many things have changed. And it, and you think about the generations of people who, you, you know, the young kids who grew up, like their formative years were in, in COVID. And you think about how, how different their whole outlook is on life. And, you know, we just look back at, you know, our youth and we were still like, before cell phones still riding bikes and you know had to come home at sundown and like stuff like that and to watch VHS tapes. Every There was so much more community just in our lifespan, where again, you go to the movie store to rent your movies, and you go to the theater to watch your movies, you know, you play with the kids in your neighborhood, you know, and what's crazy and that exists almost. It's so crazy to think now how temporary that was at the time, but we didn't know it. You know, you only know what you know. Like, but man, looking yeah. back, we are the physical media generation. And how lucky we, we sure. were to have that. Yeah. I mean, because it's not and it's it's not even just the movies that were coming out, which were better. I think, but also it was the way they were released and the way they were kind of held in high regard and the way that they would slow release them as opposed to, I don't think there is value in quickly giving somebody what they want immediately. I, I don't, 
think it creates any sort of anticipation, which is part of it. Yeah. I'm grateful for it, but also I do get a little sad. I wish it was still around. And I feel like I find myself like trying to accept, <laughs> trying to say goodbye slowly, you know, to, to that. I mean, I don't think you have to. I think it's one of these things that the pendulum swings far. And I think, you know, one thing you see is that there's like a whole new movement with a lot of physical media too. I mean, there's all these companies that are popping up and doing like, I mean, Criterion really like set the standard and then Arrow, you know, Arrow has turned, yeah. Yeah, Arrow's turned into, a, you know, like, because remember Arrow used to kind of be not like as regarded. Kind of culty. Arrow, like a monster. Yeah, but now it's a monster with all these great titles You're and right. really awesome design and stuff. And they, they really elevated their game. And then all these other companies like Umbrella and there's another couple of them too. Oh, uh, yeah. These like, Look, releases and stuff. I have a thousand DVDs in here in this fucking room over here. Like, well, six hundred Blu-rays. But no, it's it's a real thing. But mine are mine are right over there. So yeah, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. I have a look at all these. I got all kinds of posters. Well, I'm oh a, yeah, a, nice. But I think what I'm saying is that I think that one thing you start to see is it, it's also one of these things too that you know I read this article the other day. It was like some of the most successful movies that are in theaters are retrospectives. People showing old movies and people go out in droves to see them because they want to see the shining on the big screen. And, and that it, excites me because like as a filmmaker, it feels like you have no value unless your movie's new. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. as a, a filmmaker, when it comes to film sales and you just went through that, right? That we are still working on international sales. It's, you know, it's such a kind of a niche sort of idea and story about a particular, you know, American subculture. I think it's uh, tough for the other markets to see the value in it. But, you know, my feeling is that as the movie will get out there, it will, you know, catch a little bit more uh, attention uh, based on the subject matter and because uh, Juggalos are big fans of physical media. And so I think as it, as it goes, it'll sort of, you know, that's great. That's our hope. The target audience is very clear, I think, with this one. First, as far as jumping yeah. off into like a region, not regional, but I'm, I'm equating it to like that basketball documentary I did, Something in the Water, about my hometown that I, a few years ago we yeah. did. And it, it was so nice to know that I was going to definitely target North Carolina first, like Eastern North Carolina, yeah. and then expand out. And like it took off, you know, like, and so I think it's very similar to that where like, you know, you already have those juggalos, right? You already have that subculture, yeah. which is very exciting. And especially with like, if you can get some physical media moving around, come on yeah. that right there. I'm already yeah. like enlivened again, you know, that's great. And, and there is a part yeah. of this, I think there's still a lot of everyday people that are just fine purchasing and owning, actually owning a fucking copy of a movie as opposed to we don't mm -hmm. own shit except for an Amazon subscription, you know, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so yeah. I hope you kill it with the physical media. That's exciting. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we hope so too. We've taken our own theatrical rights and we're going to do a little bit of our own kind of thing as well by keeping the theatrical. And we're trying to do a few more of like those sort of event type screenings nice. where, where there's more Q and A's and things like that. There's been some success, you know, with some small films, like I know, like The People's Joker and like Hundreds of Beavers. They did a lot of those sort of event type screenings and they seem to do it pretty well. For Amazing. Them. Because I think, again, it's just like more of those things like treating it like with these kind of independent small things. You know, when you see a band live, sometimes you're just going to you have a little bit more connection to it. Your filmmaker talk about their films sort of connects you to the film sometimes even more it's not even just um, the product again it's just how it's released how it's how it's uh delivered you know how it's given well and truthfully we're humans and we want to see humans that's it do stuff that's it look this last documentary bell v my man vincent zamarco right there behind me you know his philosophy that we captured on film and it's the best part of the doc it's like just it's all about just People are used to sitting around a fire and ch exchanging and talking and being listened to. And like, it ain't that complicated. We already know the deal and how we had an analog childhood and a digital social media adulthood. But let's be honest, that's yeah. kind of what's happened, right? That's that's uh, fragmented the community aspect. Yeah. I, I do think one thing I'd say about some of these festivals, particularly the genre festivals that I've experienced, sure. is that you really do start to sense more of a community and you start to sense that some of the younger people are actually really hungry for that and that they really do attach themselves to it. Um, 
I mean, you know, we played on a lot of genre festivals, you know, Splat was, was a genre festival and, and uh, Boston Underground and Calgary Underground and Panic Fest. And, you know, in every one of those situations, they were all like very community based. People are just like, they're hungry for stuff. They all sit around and, and kind of like watch the same movies over and over, you know. So it's um, not good. So it's, it's healthy. The culture's out there. I think it's resurging. It's like everything. You have to be like mindful of it and like work towards doing it and like go out to see your friend's film and go see things and like you have to like make an effort because well sure you can also sit home and not do that <laughs> yeah you can get your big tv but is yeah. your yeah talk about the moment you got the invitation to splat so actually what happened was we were very lucky we actually got into new orleans film festival first nice. and we got the acceptance from new orleans first and seeing as how it's a hometown festival, I was really, I really wanted to play there. Also, like New Orleans Film Festival is not, you know, it's not an easy festival to get into, no. even if you're from here. They have a very strong taste and you have to hit it. Uh, it helped that we had a number of alumni in our like producing and, and the DP and a few other people that were a part of the film and they helped lobby for us. But at the same time, it was still kind of a shot in the dark or whatever. We got New Orleans first because I had gotten a number of rejections before then. And it spent almost the better part of a year, not necessarily a whole year, but probably about like eight months, like waiting from moment of completion till we got the, the fun first. part. Yes. <laughs> oh, the fun part. Yeah. It is the fun part when you get accepted, but the, that eight months was not fun. <laughs> not at all. Sarcasm it was, at its finest. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was very miserable. That's when I started seeing my therapist, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but you got um, that. That's funny. But you got that invitation, that, that email from New Orleans. Was, I literally dropped on the floor crying. I mean, it was, you know, the it was such a, a, a elated moment. I, I was finally felt we ha finally have a home. You know, we had gotten a couple of yeses from some really small ones before, but my sales agents kept saying, don't, you know, you can't do that world premiere status. It hurt every time because it was like, ah, oh, I just want to show my film to people, God, you know. And For then sure. really quickly afterwards, I think within a week of getting New Orleans, the sales agents were like, Splat wants it. And, you know, Splat is part of the Millier group, which is kind of a pretty like prestigious group of, of the genre festivals and particularly in Europe. Well, and there's even more fantastic fest in, is in Fantasia. Just, just a, a really cool, you know, all the cool genre fests are part of the Millier group, stitches. And so when we got that, the inv invite we were like i was like oh hey okay. so i was like oh shit can we make this work and thankfully new orleans was cool enough they were like you know we're happy with the north american premiere go ahead and world premiere and in, in, in poland that that's great and then it was really cool because off ramp was actually the it was the first world premiere in the history of splat they had never had a world premiere in their whole festival. oh wow nice so it was like actually really special for them and for me Really, like, I was like, how is this movie going to translate to a Polish audience? Like, both literally and figuratively, it's about juggalos and whatever. And sure enough, they loved it. I mean, they voted it best film in the festival. So, oh, really? And that was all, yeah, I was, it was all audience voting. So, um, cool. Also, Poland has shown us love with our film, uh, crime film we made a few years ago called Chameleon. AMC actually picked it up and, and it's running in Poland right now in Polish. And I would love to just see this movie spoken in Polish doves. It'd be hilarious. Wait, that's awesome. So it's playing now. And so how many, and that's, it's been done for a number of years. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, my sales agents, um, they were like, yeah, AMC Poland wants it. I'm like, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Here's amazing. some money too. I'm like, what, huh? Money and yeah, AMC. Yes, what? Thank you. How? What? Wow, okay. Awesome. Sure. Where do I? Where, well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. When is it already playing right now? Yeah, I think it started about a year ago, and it's been. They they still have the rights, so yeah, maybe it's on repeat. I'm not sure at this point, but just again back to film sales awesome. and just like, oh my god, those victories, those those victories that you get uh, when you find your home, like you said, you know, when you get your fe first film festival, that's a legit strong film festival, and you know you're going to be okay because you're just dangling out there in space, like it sucks. But once you get that that landing spot and then beyond the festival, once you get to sales and where you're in the it seems like you're in the middle of right now, as far as you, you figured out your you figured out your domestic sales and you're now in the process of getting some foreign sales. Man, it's just such a sense of fulfillment and relief and the circle kind of closing up a little bit, you know. Can you reveal any sort of plans that you guys have so far, what you've talked about, what you're expecting with that? We have set a date of uh, September 6th uh, this year. 
you know, it'll start out as a SVOD, you know, AVOD kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We are planning on doing our own theatrical run that we are retaining the rights for, but it's going to come out concurrently. Mm -hmm. Reaching out to a number of small theaters and things, we're kind of doing that and figuring it out. You're, fo you're full walling bit. it essentially, in a way. Uh, we're actually off. We're not. We're hoping not to. We're hoping to get booked. It's a thing called Art House Convergence. That one of the, basically like some of the people I've been at these festivals with that kind of like just started to ask the questions like, "Hey, would you just want to book this film? It played well at your festival, you know that kind of thing." Mm -hmm. And uh, they've kind of given us some ideas about this art house convergence, which is this manner. So hoping to not have to four wall it. Uh, we may have to in some markets, right. LA maybe, you know, uh, New York maybe. We're in the middle of that part of it right now. I think, you know, one thing about our film is it needs to have a bit of a cult status to it anyway. We had somebody, Blumhouse, who a friend of ours, you know, a, fr a friend of a friend watch it. And they said, oh, we love the film, but we couldn't do anything with this. This movie needs to be a cult. Mm. Hit. Like it needs to kind of find its audience. And I mean, I, in some ways, I think that's sort of, you know, like icing on a turd. But at the same time, I think it, there is something to that because I think there's something to people being able to discover a film and like being able to like make it. it they kind of feel like it's sort of their own, not necessarily totally all their own, but they just feel like they're like vested in it. Sure. And you're like, oh, that's that's pretty neat. You know, that's kind of what we're hoping. I think we have this we have a big grassroots kind of like campaign because of the juggalos. You know, we always try to talk to every juggalo we can and, and try to connect with all of them because like I said, when I show this movie, I'm like more nervous about showing it to juggalos than I am to about to, to normies because I'm like, yeah, you know, normies, I'm like, I'm sort of like, okay, take it or leave it. But if the juggalos like it, at least like I feel like I was earnest, you know. You, know? you may not ever know, but I think you feel it. I think yeah. there's a sense of like feeling when something isn't right. And, you know, I mean, I also think that giving yourself the ability to continue to edit your work, meaning like, you know, we had the reshoots, which is something that I never would have thought of in the first place. But after doing it now, I'm sort of like, I almost feel like I have to have reshoots anytime I do a movie now. It was so valuable. This never would have happened if we didn't have that little break to like look at it and put it back. I'm to the point now where I'm thinking about re-editing Actor for Hire, the 2015 film, where I watch it. And it's like, we just got the rights back from Gravitas Ventures after like eight years. And I'm like, okay, we got them back. And of course, these buyers judge films based on their year. You know, they don't look at anything very valuable unless it's a new film or unless there's, you know, some low hanging fruit, a famous face. Anyways, that being said, it's like, fuck it. Why don't I just turn this 90 minute film into an 85 minute film? Because when I watch it, when I revisit it, my 41 year old self, I'm like, ah, oh, it's good, but I got to get Frank Capra on this thing and just like make the pacing better, you know, like, but I can just cut out five minutes and re-export and put it up on Amazon myself. Why not? So I think sure. I'm going to do that. There's also, there's this other one. I keep getting these ads on Instagram about this new online distribution thing that they're talking about too. I know that like Jim Cummings started Quiver, which is the one of Jim those. Cummings and did? There's a nut. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I think one of the pioneering ones of it. But then there's this other one, Meta New or something weird like, uh, I'll send it to you, whatever. But it's, it's not about how things are being distributed right now. It's about how things are going to be distributed a year from now or like two years from now, or even like how you can create the the space that's, that needs feeling, you know, like what is the democratization? What is the next version to get it to the people? What is the, the free market yeah. for your, from well, film to a, audience? Isn't there, that, isn't there the other one like film hub or something like that yep. too? Yep. Yep. There's a number of these, but I, I do agree. I mean, it's like some of these things that you're like, if you just had it somewhere where people can click on it and you just do your own sort of, advertising and marketing for it. I don't know. Because a lot of these uh, distributors slash aggregators, whatever, they they don't do any marketing. You know, they, they take money for it. I don't see much. What was that one aggregator that uh, went down that took everybody's money? What the hell was that called? Two years ago. Remember that? No, uh, I wasn't into that part of it. That's new for me. Film aggregator. Uh, distributor. You haven't already heard okay. Distriber, one of the most popular indie film aggregators, is going under. As a result, countless filmmakers have been hung out to dry, some of whom have been owed payments from the company for many months without any fair warning. That's like the, the nightmare version of <laughs> aggregation, I guess. Going wrong. Yeah, no, no kidding. Whew. And like their film is like locked in on all these sites, but they can't activate it or uh, access it. So Coven, tell me about Coven. How did you connect with them? 
Absolutely. Coven's really great. We met them through Tim, my co-writer. Uh, Tim went to AFI and he went to AFI with uh, Kendall, who is one of the members of Coven, sale, the sales agents. And uh, we were kind of like looking for it and, and it was one of these things. So Tim sent her a link to the movie and she was like, oh, this is awesome. And it was like, let me, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. I think it's one of these things that they keep, you know, we have a weird little movie and they've always had faith in it and keep you know the faith in it that's been really encouraging too you know as you kind of go through this kind of stuff like it's very personal it's very personal connection which has been really excellent and just like always taking the time to like talk about certain things and whatever so they've been really you know great so yeah that's kind of how we met them and they've they've been excellent they those splat festival for instance they basically kind of got that they they essentially hooked that up we didn't even officially apply it was one of those things where they knew Monica at Splat. It was like she was looking for stuff and they were like, here's this crazy movie. And she was like, what is this? I love this. Huge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so stuff like that is really, really huge. You know, and that's another thing for people, again, back to the idea of film festivals and like how brutal it can be when you get these no's. It's like we had both of our first yeses, both where people were actively working to get us in these festivals. We had our sales agents working to get us in, in to spin to get us in a splat and they were just showing it around to whomever they could talk to and they knew. Likewise in New Orleans, we had, you know, people on our team that have been alumni and knew people actively just like I mean, it, the film has to still be good. That's the baseline. Especially film students and stuff start to think like, well, does this mean my movie is not good? And it's like, no, no. That's the being a good movie is just like the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it, that's that's the bottom of the requirements. Prerequisite. It has to be good. It's a prerequisite. And there's also like pre-screeners or people who are watching it ahead of things. You don't you don't know who these people are who are seeing them. What is it? You know, doesn't mean that it's just they all have this thing in this all this process. So they were actively working. Likewise, more of the people that we met and like talked to and showed the film, we applied to a bunch of other festivals. And then started like kind of probing them and trying to get them and and sort of using. And I it's also one of these interesting things, like certain festivals sort of, I feel like are like tastemakers. Like Boston Underground Film, Film Festival was an excellent experience for us. It's a pretty small festival, but they have a really great taste and really awesome people involved. Exclusive and experience. That's nice. Yeah. And when they doing it there, I feel like we got a number one, we got a ton of great reviews, which is so valuable, as you know, as an independent filmmaker, we got tons of great reviews. And we just kind of I think that it started to spread the word even more amongst a certain group of people, uh, particularly other film watchers. And, and, and some of the pre screeners were I got this DM from a a person, uh, she just DMs me on Instagram. I was like, I was a pre-screener for Boston. And I just want to tell you, thank you. I'm a juggalo and a film nerd. Oh. And I just want to tell you, thank thank you for making this movie. Nice. And I was like, oh, you're great. Shout out to the programmers who champion a film that don't get any love or credit back in return. Uh, Santa Barbara Film Festival, Belle V, this last film that we did uh, after the Q&A guy came up and said, hey, I'm wanting the programmers. I was the first round programmer. I'm the one that pushed your film along. I'm like, thank you. Love you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Let's go get a drink, baby. You know? Yeah. And then, and then always, to circle yeah. back to getting it, you know, f- film festivals, like you can't get too high or too low. You just got to make your thing. You got to put it out and you got to move on. And Werner Herzog, I remember, I remember listening to his master class, I think it was. And he was talking about how he, uh, he had to screen some film for some studio exec or something. And the guy, you know, how Werner Herzog is though. He, he'd be exaggerating, but he was just saying how, studio exec came back and said, this is the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. And Bernard Herzog said, I don't care. It's the movie I wanted to make and I'm going to move on. Like that moment for me where it's like, you don't have to get too high or too low about it. You can't accept and honor the instincts that that led you to make that film and then just live with it. And if you're not going to make everybody happy, no matter what you do or what you say or what you make. So you might as well at least just make yourself happy and live with it and move on. So I think that's important, you know, to not sure. beat yourself up too much. I think that's really important. When, and to be proud of yourself and to pat yourself on the back for getting it. First of all, from getting it to the finish line. And secondly, you probably did make something quality that's that's important to someone, if not a, a group of people. I mean, this is uh, the hardest thing in the world to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, I think it is absolutely the single hardest thing. Maybe not 
There's might be other things, but it's among Very the hard. hardest things to do. And every movie is a miracle. I've heard people say that, and it is the truth. It really is an absolute miracle that it all it, get, it happens. And how lucky we are that we get a chance to fucking do this and make these things and pursue the dreams that we have. And I'll tell you, there is absolutely nothing like. I mean, I cherish every single chance I get to watch this movie with a crowd because I'm just like, this is so rare. And how many people get a chance to make some piece of art that they've created and have a group of people view it and respond to it is just, I just feel so lucky. And uh, to say what you're saying too, is that, you know, I always look back, Rick Rubin says this thing. He's like, there's not a single piece of quality art that has ever been made to please someone other than the audience of one of the person who's making it because you have to make you know what you think is cool and if you build it they will come i i truly believe and like you said at the very least you know if i made a movie that i wasn't satisfied with because i was working you know i was trying to please somebody else then i wouldn't be able to sleep at night and at the very least i'm able to sleep at night and whatever success or not that it has at least Like you said, at least we get to make something that we feel proud of. Pain is temporary. Film is forever. John Milius. That's right. Do you have a quote for us? Uh, I do. I have a great quote, and it's also in my film very often, and it's from, it'll bring this full circle again. It's uh, from a Ranya Werner Fassbender film called Ali Fear Eats the Soul, and it's like at the very beginning of the film, there's just a title card that reads, happiness is not always fun. That is a really heavy statement, and it's something that I was in a really dark time in my life, and I watched that movie, and it was really revelatory to me. And I put it in off ramp and it's a very interesting, like kind of uh, coda that they sort of say that people say a couple of different times in the movie that are pretty interesting. And it's just one of those things to remind yourself that being happy isn't easy. It takes a lot of work and you really have to work at it. And um, I think that, you know, as filmmakers, we are happiest when we're making things or when we our work is being appreciated or whatever but it's all relates back to our work it's like you said you kind of can't separate the two they're not really different like work and life are like the same at least for me maybe you figured out how to balance it but to me it's like you know people are like well you know you want to go on vacation you want to do it i was like i don't want to do anything in anything ever other than make movies that is the only thing I ever want to do is make movies and watch them. <laughs> it's just satisfaction. Last question. Past film that's inspired you that's most closely to off ramp. Absolutely. Uh, Wild at Heart. David Lynch's Wild at Heart is one of my all time favorite films. Because one thing about off ramp is and what people kind of like comment on is how it's like kind of it's hard to pin down as exactly what kind of film it is. It's very funny. You're laughing a lot, but there's a real intense drama. There's some scary moments. There's some gory moments. There's, you know, kind of laugh, cry, cheer sort of thing. And I've always felt, and my co-writer Tim and I have always felt those are like our favorite movies are ones that are like, uh, you know, not just one kind of thing, but they're a little bit of everything. So Wild at Heart to me is that kind of movie where it's dark, it's funny, it's weird, it's, 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 it's triumphant. It's got those moments that sort of set you off and you're just like not really sure what's going on. Plus, it's got this like through line of like heavy metal and like the flashbacks and the sort of like things and like all of that stuff really plays into uh, off ramp. And, you know, when anybody here listening sees the film, I think they'll see sort of like a kind of a connection uh, to that, that and then. The other two I'll just really quickly mention is that when we were writing it, we often would call it Juggalo Sideways. We always liked the idea of like sideways with Juggalos. I also kept telling my co-writer, I'm like, I want to make like the Terrence Malick Juggalo movie. You know, Badlands is another big reference in that way too, just another road trip. But absolutely Wild Heart is like really like, that tonal thing and that thing that because again it makes you kind of it makes you cringe it makes that david lynch ambiguity like you know there's like substance but you can't put your finger on it right kind of vibe like blue velvet or whatever like ah man it's a bad boy he is a bad boy and i i I was always really connected with his work and i i just think that wild heart like really kind of sums it up for me because it's like his one of his most hopeful sweet movies in the end we want to connect with people. I think art is like one of the only weapons that we have as humans to rally against the things that we disagree with because art really can move people to a point of like changing their lives. And I think it's very true. And I think it's also like something that we kind of like throw off. But you I mean, think about it for you, like, you, you know, just quickly thinking, you go, well, is, it, is there an album that like really 
connected with me and got me through a tough time. And there's absolutely one. Oh my God. Is there a movie that you connect with and said that you change the way you think about people or life? And they're like, absolutely. There's many of them. And yeah. so you think as doing that, you know, we just are so lucky to get the chance to do this. And I think too, for other young people who are listening, there are lots of avenues to do and to tell these things and, and, you know, keep pursuing them because, and that goes back to the thing of keep making instead of just like, you know, it's just, it's just keep making, you know, create, create, create. Love that. Perfect place to end it. Thank you, my friends. Good seeing you. Please like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media at Past, Present, Future. And let us know in the comments section what movies you're watching. Thank you so much for listening to the Past, Present, Future podcast, and we'll see you next time. Peace.